What now? Good evening, everyone. We've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So we're going to, we're getting started on time here. We're in the book of Luke, the 22nd chapter, and uh, we're going to pick up where we left off. Last week, before we do that, we do want to begin with prayer. We want to keep uh, Cheryl in our prayers as she's going to be having surgery this um, Friday as she gets ready for being able to do the dialysis. Um, do we have any other specific prayer requests? All right. Then let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you give to us for the day that is... Uh, uh, ours to enjoy and to be reminded of your goodness and graciousness. Father, we thank you for all of the blessings that you give to us, but especially the, the hope that we have through Jesus. And uh, as we're gathered here tonight, Father, we ask your blessings on those that are sick and suffering and those who are uh, facing various difficulties. Father, for the, for the families in Baltimore, um, the ones that lost the loved ones on that bridge, we, we pray that you would comfort them. And we pray also, Father, for our sister Cheryl uh, as she's getting ready for this procedure. We pray that it'll go well and uh, that uh, she'll be uh, able to recover quickly. And uh, in the meantime, Father, we just pray that you give her comfort and peace. We know there are many others that are suffering in one form or fashion, and we just pray that you would bless them uh, and comfort them in their grief, heal them in their sickness, and, Father, give peace to all. And always, as always, Father, we ask that you would use us to be a vessel of your mercy, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray, and amen. All right, I'm going to get a bottle of water here. Okay, so we uh, on the, are on the night of Jesus' betrayal. Uh, Jesus has celebrated uh, the meal with them, instituted the, uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, spoke of the new covenant that is to come, and um, also... Uh, in the immediate context, uh, uh, the disciples have been arguing about greatness, and Jesus uh, rebukes them for that. And then he predicts Peter's denial. And Peter, of course, says, I'm ready to die for you. <laughs> I'm not going to deny you. And then Jesus says, well, you know, yeah, you are. <laughs> That's going to happen. Um, and then the conversation continues, and this is where we left off last week. And he said to them, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said nothing. Then he said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack, and he who has no sword... Let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. This comes from 
Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant passage. For the things concerning me have an end. In other words, it's getting close to that time. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. And so we got through that last week, and, and admittedly, this little section, on the, on the one hand, is fairly simple to understand. On the other hand, what Jesus has to say about the sword has perplexed people, and perhaps has perplexed you, and, and um, I think... Um, I think when we take into consideration the total context and everything that happens, I think we can begin to see what Jesus is talking about here. And what we see at the beginning is Jesus reminds them, you remember, remember he's just told them, he's just told Peter, you're going to deny me. Now, why would Peter do that? Huh? Huh? Well, Satan was after him, right? You know, Satan has asked for you, and Jesus says, but, you know, I'm not going to let that happen. But why would somebody as vociferous in his support of Jesus, why would he deny Jesus? What circumstances would arise that would cause somebody like Peter to deny Jesus? Fear. Yeah, he saw it just got real. And so Jesus said, listen, when you first went out, what kind of reception did you get? Well, everybody received them gladly, right? But he says, now things are going to get a little different. And so you're not going to necessarily be able to rely on people to provide for you. And, and you're going to face some hardships along the way, therefore, the sword. Now, the, the question people have about that sword, was that, well, is that so that they can, you know, people who are angry with them about the gospel, that they can chop their heads off? Well, we'll consider that in just a moment. But Jesus, but notice Jesus' response. He says, it is enough. <laughs> now, some people have read that to mean Jesus says, yes, two swords is enough. Now, I want you to just th think about that for a moment, right? Two swords is enough for what? Is it enough to, for a revolution? Is it enough for any serious attack? Is it enough for, you know, even, you know, a, a defense against a mob? No, it's not. So that ought to make us think, in my mind, what he's saying here has nothing to do with the sufficiency of their weaponry. I think what he's saying is, to put it in modern-day vernacular terms, Jesus, I, I suspect Jesus is a little frustrated with them, and he's like, whatever. You're, in other words, you don't know why you've missed the point. And some, and, and, and some translations uh, give it kind of a, instead of it is enough, or it's like, that's enough. Any of you ever say, Sh Sheila, you ever say that to your kids? That's enough. You know, they're, they're, it's like they're missing the point. And, uh, but they're going to learn soon enough. And so he says it is enough. In the previous ministry, they would relied on the goodwill of the people they encountered as they went around preaching the gospel. But hostility and difficulty would await them. And notice, though, that there's something interesting that sometimes I think people just overlook. What did Jesus say about them immediately before taking the sword? Let him sell his garment and buy one, for I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Now, the, in the immediate context, when Jesus says you need to do this, for it must be fulfilled, I believe Jesus is making a direct connection to the fulfillment of the prophecy and what he just told them. Now, some people, and, and rightfully, will acknowledge that, you know, Jesus was, uh, you know, 
he was crucified between two thieves, right? Numbered among the transgressors. Uh, and some people will point to that. But it, Luke puts this in the context of his instructions to the disciples about going, you know, getting the swords. And they say, well, we got two swords here. And he says, well, that's enough. You know, <laughs> you missed the point. Because he had just told them, have some swords because in some way this is going to be a fulfillment of the transgression of the, of the, of the prophecy that he was numbered among the transgressors. Well... Now, just stop and think about it. The authorities come up on some people, a group of people, and they find them with swords. Do ne'er do wells carry weapons around? Yeah, of course they do, right? Now, there. Now, some would say, "Well, there's there 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 could naturally be this idea of people carrying for protection against animals and so on and so forth." But I think the idea behind this is that, that Jesus is telling them to have the swords because, in essence, that's going to be used as part of the whole thing to fulfill the idea that Jesus is uh, he, he's, he's with a band of rabble-rousers. I mean, what are they accusing Jesus of? What is the charge that they accuse him before the Romans? That's not for the Romans, though. Yeah, yeah, he's, it's a, an insurrection, a rebellion, a revolution, you know. That's what they're trying to do. Well, we found these two swords, <laughs> you know. I, I believe that there is some connection to that, that Jesus understands that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're about to see, and, and, and how Jesus responds to that. There, you know, there are some people who say, well, yeah, well, that's, he's talking about the right of self-defense and going. He's not, because as soon as they use it to defend him, he tells them, put it away. Now, interestingly enough, um, oh, I forget which, which pope back in the 600s or something like that said, saw that, that the two swords were symbolic. One was the sword of the gospel, and the other represented the sword of the state. And for, so that pope then form, fomented, or for, formed this doctrine of the combination of church and state. And, well, the church should be able to make all of the rules and stuff. <laughs> and so it's a, an interesting doctrine that arose from that. But nonetheless... Jesus says to do this in order to fulfill the prophecy that he was numbered among the transgressors. And so they misunderstood the point of the swords. Turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 26. And verse 52. 52, but Jesus said to him, this is after Peter strikes uh, Malchus' ear, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? So then, so... First of all, the scriptures say that Jesus has got to go through this, and Peter is being Satan again, you know, an adversary. He is mindful not of the things of God, but of the things of men. And, um, and so he tells him to put away, and in fact, he, he heals the servant's ear. You know, and, and so one of the points that he makes is, listen, the propagation of the gospel is not going to be at the point of a sword. And Jesus said, if, if, and if I needed protection, I, I don't need you, Peter. <laughs> I've got 30,000 plus angels that I could call on at any minute to do this. God has given him that, that choice in that regard. So in some respects, I think when Jesus tells them to take the sword, it's so that they can learn a lesson about the nature of the kingdom. But it also becomes a bit of twisted evidence 
that is used against him, as it were. And, and we're going to see how the people came out to, to, to get him, to attack him. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the, there are some people, you know, who, who would suggest, well, this, you know, this is, you know, we can, we, can, we can fight to get the gospel going. And Jesus says exactly the opposite. And by the way, do we have a single solitary example in Scripture of any apostle, any servant of God ever using the sword to propagate the gospel? We have one example where Paul appeals to Roman authorities to protect him from those who have tried to kill him, but that's a different thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, thing, but, uh, um, I, I think that, um, that having the sword, and the way that I see this is that, um, that they had the ability to defend themselves, and so they had swords that were there. Jesus made the point that my kingdom is not of this world. And, right. and when he was on trial in, in John uh, 18, 36, he specifically said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Right. So to me, it, you know, the whole time the Jews were thinking there's going to be even an earthly kingdom, even his disciples thought right. that. To me, this was like him just blatantly saying, that's not the purpose. That's not the purpose. And, and I think, I really do believe that the idea was for Peter and the others to learn that lesson. That this isn't going to be how God's will is going to be. It's not going to be at the point of the sword anymore. Now, there were occasions in Israel where God used the sword, right? Because Israel was the civil state. They weren't just a religion. They were a nation. And nations wage war and have swords and do all of that but that in, in some and it's hard to separate that from you know Israel the religious from the civil but in this case Jesus is making a clear distinction he's saying my kingdom is different than worldly kingdoms now and so it does it doesn't operate in the same ways and I believe that's really the point that is going on here all right so we've got to keep moving Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. The narratives tell us that during the day, uh, you know, in this last week, that he would, um, uh, he would go into the city, he would teach and do all of that, and then in the evenings, he would go uh, up to the Mount of Olives. And so as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. Now, that's, that's actually, that may seem like kind of an ancillary point, but it's important. Jesus had established a pattern. In the day, he would be teaching and whatever, and then he would go to this place. Well, how did Judas know to find him? Because that's what Jesus had been doing. He had established that pattern. Now, again, Jesus knew what Judas was going to do, and he went anyway. He followed the pattern that he had been following all along. So, his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And now, the idea is they're not succumb. What temptation is he talking about? In the immediate context. Yeah, Nefertiti. Worldly temptations, yeah, absolutely. But what was their immediate temptation going to be? Yeah. How many of them stuck around? Yeah. Well, John was at the cross, right. But, but on, on that night, all of them flee. Now, they kind of get up, you know, peeking around the edge. But, but you're right. I mean, for, for all intents and purposes, only one had the courage to go up to the cross when that moment arose. And so I think the temptation here is, is the temptation to... To, to lose faith, and, um, um, you know, the devil was at, devil wasn't after just Peter. He was after them all, and so you got Peter, James, and John here with him, and so it says, saying, uh, so he goes, and he, he withdraws from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Well, I'm going to keep reading and we'll, we'll talk about some of this because there's a bit of a repetitious theme here. But I, but I think the repetition is important as well. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, um, it doesn't say that he was, his sweat was blood. He didn't say that his sweat was infused with blood. He said he was, it, it, the idea is he was sweating so profusely, it was as it were, as if he had been cut <laughs> and was bleeding. How much intensity and do you have to have in a, and, and by the way, he, he is not physically exerting himself here. This is emotional angst and agony. Stop. Does, does pain, uh, ooh. have any of you ever noticed that like when you're really in pain, you sweat? Yeah. I mean, you can have a physical reaction to, to pain, both physical and emotional. And so Jesus is, is, is so earnest in his prayer that it's like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he arose up from prayer and came and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. This had been a tough night for the disciples because Jesus had told them some really difficult things. And on the one hand, I think they got it. They got he's going to die, but they also don't understand it. And they are overwhelmed by it. Have you ever been overwhelmed? Have you ever just had so much information thrown at you that it just kind of just drains you, saps you of your energy and your life? Well, that's, that's the idea that you get here. And by the way, it's been a pretty busy week. They've been, you know, all of them are going to be tired. And there's a lot of tension. Does tension make you tired? Yeah, it does. So these, you know, these last few days have just been intense. And now Jesus brings it down and he says, one of you is going to betray me. And you guys, you're... You, you don't get it. Why are you arguing about greatness? And, and then he tells Peter directly, you're going to deny me, and it's going to happen real quick. It's going to happen before the rooster crows, not once, not twice, but three times. And then he says, you guys need to pray lest you enter into temptation. They are confused and scared. And so they fall asleep. And then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Prayer is a powerful resource against falling into temptation. And so Jesus tells them to pray. Now, getting back to that thing that we talked about earlier, he says this all takes place as he was accustomed. This was not, what did Jesus do when he went up on the Mount of Olives all through the week. Do you think this is the first time he prayed? No. One of the things that we see throughout Scripture is that Jesus was a man of prayer. As much as he was God, he was also flesh. And so prayer was a custom with him. And it was so that he too might not enter into temptation. Remember, everything that we read here is that, that ultimately he does have a choice. He begs the Father, let this cup pass from me. I do not want this to happen. But not my will, your will be done. And he did that, you know, three times. So to enter into temptation is not to be tempted, 
being tempted is not in and of itself a sign of weakness. Jesus was tempted in all points like we. Some people are uncomfortable with that. But I take it at its word that Jesus felt temptation just like you and I felt temptation. And he dealt with the, 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 the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Those temptations were there for him because he was just as much flesh and blood. He was just as much man. He was just as much human as anyone else who had ever graced this earth. And so he knew that to overcome temptation or not give in to temptation required the discipline of prayer. Prayer acknowledges God's presence. It acknowledges his preeminence. He is there. He is real. And he is greater than I. It also focuses the mind on God's purposes. Prayer, when we do it right, ultimately leads us to thinking about what is it that God wants? What is it that God desires? What is it that God demands of me? There is time for intercessory prayer, praying for others, and so on and so forth, but our prayer also should focus on what God's will is for me. And therefore, it seeks access to the power that God has. That's what Jesus did. And if Jesus needed that power, then don't we? That's what Jesus was telling the disciples. You need this. It is important for you to do this so that you will not enter into temptation. In other words, succumb to the temptations that are coming your way. But in his prayer, he makes this prayer, take this cup from me. Now, obviously, there is the extreme physical suffering that is associated with that, and I can't imagine that anyone would relish the idea of going to the cross. It was a devastating and a humiliating and excruciating thing. Nothing about crucifixion is at all is in any way okay or easy. I mean, how many of us put off going to the doctor to get a shot? Yeah, yeah. You know, a little, oh, I'm afraid of a needle, you know. And so there is a very real sense in which there was this pain that Jesus was dealing with, but I don't really think that was the thing that was at the forefront of his mind. I think it is the role that he is playing as the sacrificial lamb and what that means as the one who is suffering the wrath of judgment upon himself. Yeah, Charlie. So, I don't know about anybody else, but a lot of times it's hard to mesh the idea of God in the flesh. Yeah. And that, wait a minute, this was the creator of the universe that came in bodily form. How is he afraid of what his eternal plan was? You know, that's kind of the confusion that goes on in the brain. But at the same time, this shows us that God the Son made a choice to come in bodily form, and that meant to be fully human, that would question, concern, have anxiety, suffer, uh, cry, all those, all those kinds of things. And then on top of that, being the I am, he knew what darkness of sin that was about to come on him. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Jesus was taking on the burden of all of the world's sins and was suffering as the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. 
And so really this idea of a cup uh, in this context, I think, speaks of the cup of judgment. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. This image of the cup is God's judgment. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord, the cup of his fury. You have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. Now, you know, an interesting thing is in the context, in these contexts, the, the prophets are talking about people who have rebelled against God and they have suffered often temporal consequences. Nations have fallen, they've suffered, there's been drought, there's been illness, and yes, even they have suffered death. These are guilty folks. But Jesus is innocent. And he's suffering for the guilty, but he's experiencing that judgment in some sense. For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, take this wine cup of fury from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. Charles Spurgeon wrote, I am never afraid of exaggeration when I speak of what my Lord endured. All hell was distilled into that cup of which our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, was made to drink. And, and, and that's an interesting thing, too, is because Satan is, on the one hand, at the heart of this, but it is also God's fury in destroying Satan. What did, what did uh, God say in the garden to the serpent? You will bruise his heel and he will crush your head. But it was through the bruising of his heel. Through that terrible agony, that death, that he became the one that crushes Satan, but he does so by, in essence, accepting the penalty for all human sin upon himself. And so when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is that moment in time when he is suspended between heaven and earth. I mean, very literally, he is, you know, he's got God above and man below, and he's there by himself. And the die is cast, and he must walk through the valley of the shadow of death. To overcome it for all of humanity. And so Jesus prays, I don't want to experience that. I don't want to experience that darkness. I don't want to experience that lone, aloneness, that separation from God. I don't want to carry that burden, right? Come to me, all you who are laboring and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How did he do that? By taking on our burden of sin. I think sometimes we don't comprehend as well as we should the magnitude of that moment and the difficulty that was associated with the fact that Jesus, the man, suffered as he did, the choice that he made for us. All right, moving along. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? We'll stop there for a minute. It'll, we'll, I've got another slide, but I'll just talk about this briefly. Why was it necessary for Judas to come up and kiss Jesus to identify him? Did they have street lights on Mount Olive? No, they didn't. I mean, the fact of the matter is you got a group of people and it's dark, even with torchlight. They might not necessarily recognize him. And so Judas becomes the one who points him out to the authorities that have gathered to arrest him. But he does it in perhaps the cruelest of ways, the symbolism of friendship. He kisses him. 
a greeting. Our modern, you know, vernacular is you shake somebody's hand and then stab them in the back, right? Shaking hands is a sign of friendship, of innocence. But Judas betrayed the Son of Man with a kiss. And when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them, they didn't wait to answer, obviously. And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Now, just for a moment, assume for a moment, there there are a couple of things here. How would a right-handed man cut off another man's right ear? Okay, well, first of all, he wasn't aiming for his ear. Let's acknowledge that. He, he actually missed. Let's, but how would you cut off his, huh? How would you cut off, his, if you're right-handed, how would you cut off a man's right ear? From behind. Now, we can speculate, right? So Malchus is standing there and and. and and he just comes up, and, and he's trying to kill him from behind. Or maybe, perhaps, Malchus saw it, and he ducked. You know, we don't know. But notice he says, his right ear. Gary said this before. I've heard other people say this before. God doesn't put stuff in the Bible for accident, you know. There, there seems to be a purpose there. And it, it might be the case that Malchus didn't even have a chance to defend himself. Of course, you know, he's part of a rabble-rousing crowd and, and so forth, and, you know, we might not feel any sympathy for him. But anyway, that, that's what happens. So, but Jesus answered and said, permit even this, and he touched his ear and healed him. Permit this. Don't try to stop it. I think that lesson that he said about the swords gets learned right here. But if all you've known how to do is fight to accomplish your purposes, what are you going to do then? Well, now they're going to run because they don't know what to do. All right. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. See, come out like I'm a robber, right? That, that was the whole deal. And the story would go around, obviously, that Peter tried to kill the high priest's servant, which he did. And so all of that comes together to form this picture, a, a false picture of who Jesus is, but to treat him as a common criminal, and Jesus calls them on it. And he calls them on their cowardice because he says, I've been out here all the, all the time. Why didn't you take me? Well, why didn't they take you? Because they were scared of the people. At this point, the people are on Jesus' side. Charlie, you had your hand up. So a couple of things. We talked about it when I took the class about what Jesus did when he healed Malchus. What he did was he took away the evidence against Peter. Yeah, oh yeah, right. Peter, was, Peter was guilty of a capital offense right. there. But one of the other things that if you look at John, it, he says, Who are you coming to see? And when and when he answered them, their response is we're coming for Jesus, and he says, I am he. They fell back and went to the ground. Yeah. Okay. So two things that are just absolutely baffling. One thing is, after Malchus must have felt something when Jesus healed him. It wasn't, I mean, I, I don't know how the healing takes place, but he must have felt some power go through him. How could Malchus then turn around and take Jesus in as a as a, a good point criminal and number two when these people felt the power of the holy spirit or the power of god knock them to the ground just with a word yeah something else yeah 
the, de the depravity of humanity and the, the, the power of darkness. I mean, that's what he says here, but this is your hour in the power of darkness. And the, the irony is that these were supposed to be beacons of light because who is this, who is this that has come? It's not really the Romans in charge at this point. It's the religious leaders. It's not, it's, not, it's not even the civil leaders, per se. It is the religious leaders. And Jesus says, this is your hour. This is your time. This is what this has all been leading to. And it is a reflection of darkness. All right. Man, I thought we'd get through. I was trying hard to get all the way through. But uh, next week we'll get into uh, the trials of Jesus, and um, well, I, I'd actually prepared a little handy-dandy thing for you. You don't get it this week. I had a little handout for you. I thought I was going to get to the end of the chapter, but you don't get it. All right, we'll get ready for our devotional. Good evening, everyone. Oh, goodness. Good evening, everyone. Uh, um, let's begin with number 851. Number 851. Blue skies and rainbows. A little special request from Brindley. <laughs> per usual. I, I, I enjoy requests. <laughs> so 
so I don't mind them. Um, number 851. 851. <clears throat> Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Green grass and flowers all blooming in springtime are works of the master. I live song for uh, the invitation? Oh, um, sorry. Um, <clears throat> 207 will be the invitation song. 207. Two, Perfect. Good. Tonight, what I'd like to talk about is friends and family. Our scripture for the year is Ecclesiastes 4 9 through 12, and I'm going to read that, so if you want to follow along. Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. When you fall, who is going to lift you up? When you lie down, who is going to keep you warm? When you are overcome, who is going to help you out? The answer, I believe, is family and friends. We at Bostonia are working on expanding our church family. At Bostonia here, we're working about expanding our friends. How exactly are we going to do that? The way I see that we can do it is through evangelism. Recently, here at Bostonia, we have had some recent baptisms. Here at Bostonia, we recently had a new Christians class. 
Recently, we've had Bible studies, and one of the things that we've started here recently is a greeters group. So I'm kind of working with that greeters group. So in the three-month period that we've been kind of keeping records, we've had 28 visitors. We have sent out 25 uh, welcome letters, and 10 of those visitors have returned back to our worship service. Amen. John Reed, a church consultant, has been here twice, and one of the things that he says is that when people visit a congregation, they aren't necessarily looking for spiritual things, but they're looking for friends. Coming up shortly is our annual church picnic. Coming up shortly is our friendship day. So one of the things we want to do is help expand the church. So invite a friend. So invite other family members. Let us all work together and help with expanding God's kingdom here on earth. And let's expand God's kingdom in heaven. If you have any needs tonight, uh, this is a good time to uh, come forward, ask for prayers. If you need to be baptized, a good time to come forward as we stand and sing. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus fallen tenderly upon your ear. Sweet his cry of love and pity call it. Turn and listen, stay and hear. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Stay. find the invitation song I might have accidentally forgotten it somewhere. I got it. Um, six eleven. Six eleven, first verse only. Good evening. Thank you, Ted, for your leadership and all the work that you and Claudia have been doing. Really appreciate that so much. Um, so we've uh, decided to have an early adventure day. Yeah, Saturday is going to be an adventure. <laughs> wow. 
It, uh, we may get some rain. Uh, we've never canceled a picnic before. We've had picnics in the rain. We realize that some people may decide not to come, and you may be one of those, but if you do come, uh, know that we're gonna be, there's a big pavilion that's there that's got concrete under it, and that's where we'll kind of get set up, and we'll bring some awnings, and we'll have some fun. And uh, I remember, uh, it was 30-something years ago, uh, we had a picnic where it was raining, and it was kind of like, uh, we're all kind of feeling kind of blue out there, and there was uh, Paul Sherman with his contagious laugh, and I'll never forget, it's one of my favorite picnics. It was only about 35 or 40 people, and he was just laughing, ah, ha, you know, just, you know, just that big, loud voice that he had. And uh, we had a great time, and I remember that uh, we would be underneath the covering, and then the rain would stop, and we would uh, go out there and play some games real quick, and then we'd get back before the rain started. And then, so we went through all the motions and all of that, and it was a very short picnic, but we had a great time and created some memories. I always tell my son-in-laws, whenever anything happens to go wrong or whatever, it's, it's, sometimes it's a good thing because then you remember that day. There's a chance that you uh, will forget certain days, but when some things go you know, wrong sometimes or whatever or difficult, then it makes it to where sometimes you remember that and chances are you may never not have. So I remember that rainy day with, with Paul Sherman, but there's a lot of picnics where I can't remember the picnics too well. So anyway, hopefully you guys uh, decide to come on out. If you don't, understandable. Please still invite a friend. Who knows how the Lord works? He may send somebody our way, or it may be pouring rain. <laughs> we'll still have a good time. At least I will. I'll be there. All right. Uh, uh, friendship Day on Sunday. Remember the parking? We talked about that. Uh, we've got some new signs up around the outside. They look really good. Thank you to everybody who put the, the effort into that. Uh, Charlie's my hero. Uh, that sign that we've got out front there that says, uh, thank you for, uh, welcome, thank you for, for joining us, covers that air conditioner, it's nice and big and bright, and so, real positive thing there, so hopefully, uh, what's that, Max helped you, okay, and Max is sick tonight, and he still was helping Charlie this afternoon, so, <laughs> all right, anyway, there is a ladies' Bible class next Tuesday, April 2nd, and the rest of the items are passed a couple of weeks out, so I will not mention any of those. Please stand for the closing song and closing prayer. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name. bow with me. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. We humble ourselves at this time. Our hearts are filled with thanksgiving and rejoicing as we consider all the, the blessings that we have through you, Lord. We are so thankful for our church family and the opportunity that we had this evening to share in a meal together, to share in fellowship, and to be uh, encouraged and uplifted and challenged by your word. And Lord, we ask that you would be with each and every one of us here this evening that you would strengthen us, that you would encourage us, that you would help us to bind our hearts together, to uh, make sure that we are ready to go and into the world and be about your business. And we're so thankful for the, the reminder and the hope that we have uh, through your son. And we're mindful of that example that he left for us. And we know that uh, we have a cross to carry, but we also know, Lord, that you will give us the strength to carry that cross. And so we ask that you would help us to be mindful of one another, uh, to, to look out for those who aren't here this evening, that we might reach out, that we might encourage them, uh, that we might work together as one body for your one purpose, Lord. Uh, Lord, we ask a, a special blessing this evening on our uh, upcoming events, our spring picnic and our friendship day. 
We know that a lot of work has gone into that. We know that a lot of people have reached out and invited. Uh, we ask that uh, you would bless all those involved, and that you would bless the seeds that were scattered, that hopefully uh, some might take root, that this might be an opportunity, an event for uh, encouragement, but also might be an opportunity, an event to, to build, to uh, uplift, and to uh, evangelize to those that are around, Lord. We ask that you would just bless this effort and you would bless this congregation and bless all of us as we strive to do what you would have us to do. We're so thankful for the opportunities that we have to serve. And we ask that you help us to go through this life with our eyes wide open, that we might uh, be ready to jump and to seize any opportunity we have. Lord, we're so thankful for your son and for what he has done. And we ask that you would help us to take him with us wherever we go, to guide our thoughts, our words, our actions, and what we, what we do with this life that you've given us, Lord. Where we ask that you be with us as we prepare to go our separate ways. And it's in your Son's most holy name that we pray. Amen.